back, Equity Warriors. Thanks for tuning in today to the 3E Podcast. As you can see, or maybe you can't if you're audio only, but I do have a guest today. She is a first-generation Cuban-American who served on the Hillsborough County School Board in Florida for 14 years before her successful run for the Florida House of Representatives back in 2018. There, she actively supports public education and prison reform emphasizing the enduring value of education. It is my absolute honor to welcome Florida State Representative Susan Lopez Valdez. Welcome to the show, my fellow equity warrior. Well, thank you, Dr. Berry, for having me on your podcast today and and, and having these courageous conversations that we, we need to dare to have. That is wonderful. I'm glad when you said, let's have a courageous conversation. I was like, yes, no political fluff here. We're going to get down to the real nitty gritty. But I want my listeners to get to know a little bit about you. So I want you to start with your story. You are a first generation Cuban American. You were born in New York, moved to Florida at age eight. How did you become such an advocate for public education? Wow, Dr. Berry, that's a, that's a great question because, you know, oftentimes from a little girl, my parents being immigrants and really not understanding the language very much because although in Cuba you were taught English, but you were taught the old English. Remember when we were kids, see Jane run, run, <laughs> Jane, run. Yeah, you know, well, Dick and Jane. Hey, I, I was in those books too in, in elementary school. So. <laughs> so, so, you know, so when you think about it, it's it's not the 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 street talk of everyday American talk. So it's it was very challenging for them. And as a little girl, because I carried both languages at the same time at mm-hmm. school, I had to speak English, and I was you know fluent in English. And at home, I knew I had to talk Spanish. So I grew up being biliterate, literally. And and I found myself at a very young age having to to translate for my mom and my dad. My dad, not so much because really and truly he he passed away when I was 10 years old after we moved to Florida um, when I was a little girl. So, but it was mainly more so my mom, but even at a, at a young age, at six or seven, I, I had to, to describe what a word meant, if you will. So it was tough. So I saw, I, and I experienced firsthand some of those challenges. Um, so when you, you were taught those family values, of course, you know, the importance of an education, the importance of, of, of of really infusing your culture within the culture, if you will, so you don't lose your essence of who you are. And that, that was very important. So Fast forward, when we moved to Miami back in 1972, that's, uh, we, we lived in Miami and imagined Miami in 1972 oh, yeah. is not what I, it is today. Right? No. I, I've been watching Griselda on Netflix. <laughs> Let me tell you, Dr. Barry, no joke. It was a farm with lights, yeah. so much so that I used to walk to school and I lived, for those that are that might be listening that know a little bit about Hialeah, Palm Avenue and Ninth Street is like the center of Hialeah, right? And that's right where the corner that I used to live off of. And on Palm Avenue, on my way to school, I hear this thing go, tra-ka-ta, tra-ka-ta, tra-ka-ta. I'm like, what is that? It was a bull that had left the matadero at, yes, and then they finally shot the bull and, and knocked the bull out in, in a little hotel space on the sidewalk of which I was, you normally would walk to go to school. But luckily that day, you know, God works in mysterious ways. I had to go and buy a little pen, a pencil from the little convenience store in the corner. So I wasn't walking in that side of the sidewalk. So, but I did see this bull. I looked at daddy later on when I go for daddy, where'd you bring me? This is really a jungle. And coming from the Bronx, you just had entertainment just by watching, you know, it was a different kind of, 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 of barrio, of hood, if you will, yeah. you know? So, oh my gosh. So anyways, when daddy passed away, mom had family in Tampa. So that was her support, right? So we, we were closer to my grand uncle and, and we, we moved to Tampa. And ever since then we've been in Tampa. So, so my journey, you know, throughout we are, I am the youngest of four and 
for those that that are listening and paying attention to this, you know, being a first generation American born of Cuban immigrants was tough for me because in my family dynamic, although we were four siblings, I did not have the opportunity to meet my sisters until 1979. Um, because the regime got us separated. So my two eldest sisters remained in Cuba, while my brother, which would have been the youngest, was over here with mom and dad. And back in the day, relations were normal. So they would spend the summers in in Cuba with my grandparents and then, of course, you know, come back this way. So the regime separated us. And it was tough because I didn't grow up with my siblings. I I really grew up almost like a single child because my brother being 15 years older than me, you know, he was my big brother, right? He was already off and he was in Vietnam with a veteran in Vietnam. And, you know, so I remember that time as well when, when uh, the only way that mom could know about my brother was through a priest that would come visit us in the project building, which are better known today as condominiums. By mm-hmm. the way, um, <laughs> um, you know, they would come knocking on the door, and when mommy would see through the peephole that it was the priest, automatically she teared up because mm. she did not know what was going to come out of that guy's mouth, you know, out of the priest's yeah. mouth. So it was um, those experiences helped me shape who I am and how I think about people and community, and and it's uh, that's a little bit more intimate about me. Um, I am married for 41 years. I have uh, three wonderful children and five great children, uh, grandchildren, which, oh my gosh, if yeah. you don't have grandbabies yet, you think you love your kids, ha, just wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have one and I think we're done uh, oh, with grandkids. Yeah. 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 But, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, you know, um, but definitely, you know, those, that's a little bit about myself and and, uh, you know, I decided to, to the way I winded up running for school board was through, most people don't know this, but I was a practice administrator for a, uh, a healthcare office. And my last, what I call my last mission was working with the working poor. And I, I, I just, I do not like to use this word because by the grace of God, I could be indigent yeah. in no time. But that was the name of the program, yeah. the indigent healthcare program. And a lot of what I found there were folks with uh, chronic diseases such as diabetes, coronary pulmonary artery disease, or cancer, or mm-hmm. even heart issues. And, you know, this disease, these diseases, they affect anyone at any age. And this young man came and said, and I don't know where he is today, but he came by and says, you know, can I talk to you, Susan? You're so easy to talk to. Um, and I said, sure. And I, he was going down a rabbit hole. I says, wait a minute, I'm not a mental health counselor, so I can't go there. And he was just saying, you know, I wish I could have done things differently. I'm about to lose my wife and, and my children. And I love them tremendously. And I'm sick and, you know, all those woes. And I says, well, wait a minute. I said, if you could just press that reset button and start all over again, what would you do? He says, oh, man, I'd be an electrician. I'm like, all right. Come back tomorrow. Bring me your 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 taxes. He goes. What are we gonna do? I says. We're gonna apply for the FAFSA. You're gonna go to school. Awesome. Me at the age of thirty five, go back to school. I says. Yeah, sure. Why not? You ain't got nothing else to do. You're <laughs> sick. <laughs> you don't have a job. You know. Yeah. And sure enough, he went. I I got him approved. I got him a seat at the table. He didn't have transportation. I asked the social worker to help me out with a bus pass for him. And Dr. Barry, this gentleman was, I, di- I didn't see him throughout his schooling, but I says, let me check to see if he's coming in for his appointments because he's a diabetic, right? Yeah. My goodness, he made it so that he would come early in the morning. Wouldn't even say hello. He would just mm-hmm. like, because he was on a specific schedule, so he had to catch that bus. Yeah. Fourteen months later, he comes back. Says, I don't know why you did this for me, but look, here's my license. And I said, I did that for you and encourage you to do it because you shared with me how much you loved your wife, how much you loved your daughters, and how much you wanted to change the trajectory. And through an education, you can do that. 
And he says, well, why don't you help knucklehead kids like me? You know, and this is a guy in his 30s, right? It was hilarious. And uh, he says, so why don't you be superintendent? I says, well, no, you got to be appointed for that. He goes, well, sit on that board or whatever. Okay, so hence, I ran for the board, got elected in 2004. And that's when the journey began. And the journey, you know, it's the journey is still existing. We cannot, um, we cannot, I cannot emphasize enough how important the conversations around equity and what it truly means and what it really looks like. Um, Because I don't care, you could be the, the most genius kid there's equity there for you too, because if you're that smart, we need to challenge you even more so. So yes. that's what, in my opinion, we need to do. It's not just so much for the lowest performing kids or the socioeconomic kids. Equity means across the spectrum. If yes. you have a really good, bright child, let's challenge that child and give them the, 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 the extra that they need in order to, to thrive even more so. And, and afford those opportunities for the other kids to flourish and prosper as well. So this conversation is very timely, especially in a time in which our country is, is in a really funky state. I mean, I, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this state that we're in. Uh, and and, and the state of Florida the state where I'm in. that you're in, oh, yes. Mercy. Yeah. So we have the state of public education, we have the state of public education in the state of Florida. So, you know, my listeners know I talk about Florida all the time, and it's not because I'm trying to pick a state to pick on. It's just that every time I open my 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 ed briefs that are up there and and look at the news, you know, across the nation, there's not a day that goes by that I don't see Florida or Texas, sometimes both and sometimes multiple articles about something that's being done in that state or in those school systems that is everything that equity is not, everything that would would diminish opportunities for people like the man that you helped, what he grew up to be, to help them become whatever it is that they want to, to become. So let's talk about Florida. There's Thanks. so much going on. And legislation, I think the legislation, your your session just closed. Um, well, we're in the middle of session. This you're in the middle of session. Before, but it feels okay. like day 98. You know, we, <laughs> a little bit about Florida. Um, we, we are considered a part-time legislature. Okay. So we meet six weeks in committees, right? Mm-hmm. Then after committees, we have 60 days of session. Okay. So in those 60 days, we create law. I don't know about y'all, but the way I check to see if my spaghetti is ready, I take a little piece and I throw it on mm-hmm. the wall. If it sticks yeah, it yeah. See what throw it on the wall and see what right. sticks. So, so, and that's how I feel sometimes that we are creating these these rules, these policies, because we just know that we have sixty days to make some sort of impact and say we did something. I'm from the home from the old school of, of saying, listen, let's be thoughtful about what we're doing. So that then when we do apply laws, that they are meaningful, that they are, it's a meaningful and thoughtful policy that's going to help society, that's going to help children. And, and sometimes, you know, I'm voting on things that I really don't know what the topic is, right? You know, and I have to really quickly get schooled Mm -hmm. by experts so that then at least I feel confident of what I'm voting on is, is acceptable right yeah. so so i give you that frame so that the listeners really understand because we have we have you know 50 states and right. every state does their legislations differently so yeah. florida is unique in that way that we have six committee weeks and by the way sometimes in committee weeks all we're hearing are presentations we're yeah. not even talking about bills right we're not talking about legislation ideas we're talking about this is what we may be seeing about yeah. and and what a piece of legislation might be, be created around that topic. So you get so, to think about what leadership is wanting to talk about. Yeah, yeah. And that gives them the opportunity to spend a lot of time out of session figuring out, I'll, I'll just say the way I feel, what can they do to further damage marginalized children? 
Now, what else can we do to foster our narrative about what, who deserves an education and what type of education they deserve and what they should be learning? So I want to ask you, is there anything going on that in, in the state of Florida, <laughs> I'm going to frame the question this way, that will actually address the disparities for marginalized learners, culturally diverse, linguistically diverse, economically, economically challenged are, are kids who maybe are non-gender conforming, you know, or uncertain about who they are. All of those groups um, that they that they tend to demean to blast and seem to do nothing but try and figure out how how other ways to oppress them. That that's a question that's really heartbreaking for me because in the state of Florida we have seen laws after laws that are really targeting um, these these children um, and and it's heartbreaking i have I have voted no on all those policies, but I also want you all to know more or less the makeup of this legislature. We are one hundred and twenty le- uh, representatives of which eighty five let me guess are white men. And and yeah, and white women. and women. Um, and the rest are Democrats. <laughs> so, out of the one hundred and twenty, so that right there is a disparate, right? Right yeah, there, yeah. You and no what, and no way reflective of the demographic of Florida as a whole. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. On the Democratic side of the House, there are two Hispanics. That is that is I'm unbelievable. Unbelievable. So on the Republican side, there are more Hispanics out of South Florida, right? Yeah. Um, Miami Dade area. In the Senate side, there's 40 senators, of which 28 are Republican and 12 are Democrats. So we really are. We can almost be irrelevant. If yeah. you will. We if we come up here, we're like that gnat, shoe gnat. Yeah. You know, because yeah. they they can they have the numbers to do whatever it is that they want to do. But we, we need you. We need you to keep being that gnat. Oh, because please. even if they do what they want to do, somebody has got to keep telling them it's wrong and getting that narrative out that what you're Absolutely. doing harms children and Absolutely. ultimately the state as a whole. Absolutely. So that's that's what I was going to describe it as. We become that consciousness. Mm-hmm. And and I really I really try to be kind because I believe that I don't want more wrinkles. So you have to be kind because think about it, when you get angry mm-hmm. and you frown, those they do become upside down frowns. Yeah. So you know what? Uh-uh. No, we're going to treat folks with kindness because at the end of the day, it's the example that we want to give our children that you can resolve situations by having conversations and not going the violent way, right? Yeah. So I know that I have children watching me. I know that I have high school kids and, and college kids that follow me and, and, and watch me because during that tenure of, of my um, school board member career, I, I had a whole cohort of students yeah. that, I, that I came in in 2004 with yeah. and I left with them, right? Yeah. So those kids are my kids. They're all my kids. I, I don't, there's not one child that I don't think about that if they have a situation we have to help them through it. And that's one of the things that in state state legislature, it's very bureaucratic with how you can easily help a family, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's more of a local issue. So the advocacy is different. But I, I shared with you the, the dynamics of what the, the legislature is made up so that then folks can understand, number one, the importance of voting. Number two, the importance of knowing who you're going to vote for and what they stand for. Yes. In this education space, you know that we have we have a lot of school choice. Mm-hmm. And 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 quite frankly, 
Dr. Barry, you know that in I love our public schools. I'm a, I, I am a public school kid. Um, and 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 I was also in private school for a little bit. So I know both worlds. And I got to tell you that sometimes in our public school systems, we are still cookie cutting our education to kids. Tell me about it. And and that's where that's where the school choice movement has come up up, up <laughs> from, because we all know that um, we're all individuals. I wish that every child could have an, an IEP. Yeah, because every child has their own learning style. You know, it's it's like okay, we're gonna buy the same dress. <laughs> the dress is going to look different on you than it is going to be looking different on me. Yet it's yeah. the same dress. Yeah, but it's the same right? dress. You have equality. Yeah, and equality is, I always remind folks, equality is not equity. Giving us the equity. same thing does not mean you meet our needs. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I think that sometimes our public school systems, they have to open up their eyes that times are changing. Yeah. And kids are learning differently. The moment you put a kid with one of these in their hands, yeah, you now have opened the world to them. And we, we must be able to personalize the educational experience. We must be able to be a little bit flexible yeah. because it's not like when we were in school, I mean, the, no. the challenges that our kids have today are not the same challenges no. we had. As a matter of fact, you and I never had to worry about somebody shooting up our school. No, no, ever, no. ever. No. We didn't. We didn't have he, some of the things that we did as kids that were jokes are today felonies. You know. Yeah. yeah. So there goes that school to prison pipeline of which yeah. I did discover in the state. Yeah. I yeah. saw. It. Yeah, it's there. It's it's real. I don't know if I shared with you. I probably didn't because we were chatting before. I have a book that's coming out this fall on equitable instructional practices for culturally and linguistically diverse and marginalized because I've included the the issues with gender and gender nonconformity and how we're treating those children as well, marginalized learners in our schools. And one of the things that I knew from my research years ago, went back and validated, it's still there, is a thing called this sorting process, where in kindergarten, our own implicit biases is, as teachers, because, you know, I was a teacher, educator, I prefer to use the term educator, because my job was to move children, not fill them up with the information I wanted them to have. But what happens in kindergarten is kindergarten and preschool teachers implicit bi biases about what children of color or children who are gender nonconforming should do or could do influences how they provide instruction to them. And so those children are already deemed as a troublemaker, hard to teach, doesn't want to sit still. And these labels follow that child. We start creating that pipeline to prison in kindergarten. And as long as we have states that are not, you know, a, recognizing it or that are doing things to fuel it, you know, when you take a solid curriculum away, when you take books, I'm on, the, I'm on a book burn or book ban diatribe, oh um, when you start banning books and not allowing children in school to read first person resources, primary source documents about the true history of what happened in their backyard, right? You are creating that pipeline. Think about what happens in other types of regimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the and that's first, what it is. Regime is the right word to use there. Yes. Well, yeah. the last, I mean, think about it. The state of Florida has been, all the problems that exist in the state of Florida, really the Republicans own it because they've been in yeah. control for so many years. Yeah. I mean, more than two decades. Yeah. So all of the problems that we're seeing in the state of Florida with the lack of homeownership insurances, uh, the lack of the, the rents going skyrocketed. There's so many things that we as a state could be really addressing more to to help our Floridians live um, a decent life. You know, it's not um, it's not a part of the discussion. On the contrary, 
we are talking about sending our national Florida National Guard and State Guard to Texas. Really. Yeah, yeah, because um, we we really talking, need them over here, right? Exactly. We're we're talking about you know let's take DEI out of out of schools, and you can't you can't talk about it because uh, you're making white people feel bad. Listen, I don't care if you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian. If you make somebody feel bad, you make somebody feel bad. You know? Well, you know, a lot of I, yeah, I think about that statement all the time. It's like it's you're causing you're causing children to feel anguish or whatever. Ah, the kids aren't feeling any anguish. Mm-hmm. It's the adults that have racism in their hearts that feel anguish, or perhaps I say to clarify, they may feel guilt because they're doing these type of things. Right. Or they believe in those types of things, but it's not bothering our children. Our children are curious and they seek to understand everything to make their own decisions. And as educators, we should be teaching them how to think, not teaching them what to believe. You know, and this this whole idea about that DEI is indoctrination. Well, what you're doing is indoctrinating children in your belief system instead of letting them learn about everything and discover what it is that they believe in. I mean, sociology is being taken away from uh, um, in our college campuses for as a requirement. How do you do that? <laughs> you yeah. can't make this no. stuff <laughs> up. No. You know, I, I just think that we need to Elections matter. That's all I can say. Yeah. You know, know, I say at the end of every show, vote like your life depended on it because it does. And more than just voting for president, you've got to vote for school board. You've got to vote for mayor, city council. You absolutely have to vote for your state legislature because that's who's making the educational decisions that come into policy in your school district that become what your kids are learning or not learning. Or not. And think about it, Dr. Berry, that, you know, your city council and your county commissioners, they hire your chief of police. Yep. Yeah. Your school board hires your superintendent. Superintendent. So the, it matters. It matters. And I think that, unfortunately, because of the way that the, the, the country is, is I mean, I, I don't recognize my colleagues on the other side anymore because I mm-hmm. remember we could have really good, and I, I still have those relationships here, you yeah. know, in the state legislature. That's very important um, is to build those relationships, even if you're in the super minority. Um, you still have the ability to make policy changes of which mm-hmm. I have. And so so building those relationships, and I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, but you know, you have that that small percentage, that small sector that mm-hmm. um has the loudest voices, um, that are really they're the super minority and they're getting a lot of attention. And that particular group um, the MAGAs or, you know, the bullies, the bullies, you know, is a hey, old school, I, a bully. I'll, I'll handle my bully. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. and unfortunately today kids can't handle the bully because they'll get in trouble for defending themselves as well. Right. You know, right. so we, we have to, we have to untie some of these hands. We have to have these, these conversations because we want, we want to leave our kids in a much better place than we were. And I think that there has been, you know, these isms have been around forever. Yeah. And it's how yeah. we as adults handle and want to choose those, how to do those isms. I don't see, I accept people for who they are so long as they accept me for who I am. Right. And, and, and understand that, it's okay to disagree agreeably and we can move on. And that's that yin and yang yeah. um, that makes But that you know what, cool. when you say that, when we were younger, when we were young, growing up in school, we're close yep. to the same age, I think, yes. we were taught to engage in that debate, right? To talk things through. And what it seems like we have now is like, no, this is my idea. This is what we believe. This is what's going to happen. We're not going to debate it because right now, you know, in the case of Florida right now, 
I have the power and I'm going to keep that power and I'm going to get what I want. And I don't care what you think that 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 idea of having an informed and and I, I want to say, yeah, 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 it's it's just it's not it's not happening. And then we have. So what I want to do is, you know, I would like to be more social commentary aligned and let's give some people some solutions. We have parents and community stakeholders, members of the community that could be doing more to influence educational policy for the children we're talking about, the ones that are being marginalized in Florida. What would you say to them? What do they need to do? They need to to continue the conversation. Do not give up. What they need to do is come with facts. Come with actual, you know, fact check yourself, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and call it out, right? Um, but continue the fight because it is it's super important that these voices are heard. And it's a challenge because you could you could very easily give up. There's sometimes, for instance, yesterday on the floor of the House, uh, we passed a piece of legislation, HB 49, with, which takes away all of the protections for our kids that are 16 and 17-year-old children, because I don't care. A 17-year-old still children. is still a child. Yeah. yeah. That they can work just like an adult can work, with the exception from... I think it's 11 o'clock at night to mm-hmm. six in the morning during that time. They can't work, but they could work at 6 a.m. So we're talking about 16 year olds. My grandson is 16. Mm-hmm. So he's a high school sophomore. I cannot imagine that he would get up at 5 a.m. I know it happens and it happens more and more in marginalized communities and, and particularly here in Texas, along the southern border, where we have, you know, some the kids who are workers. right migrant children, even coming over to the U.S. because they're American citizens, but their families have been deported, coming over, going to school, coming over at five o'clock in the morning, working a job, going to school, working after school, and then going back across the border. These are kids that have an eighteen-hour work school day, and it is it should be criminal that children have to do this. So I I know that it's happening, but I think about my grandson because he's my living example of what a 16 year old is in this country right now. And the idea of him working until 11 o'clock at night and getting up and being in class at seven o'clock in the morning is unconscionable. It it should not be happening. He's not going to do well academically. No, no. I had When I taught, I had 11th grade U.S. history one year, best assignment, I always say it was the best assignment I ever had because I had one prep. I had one class to teach five times, the same lesson plan five times a day. It was a little tough the first period, but by the time I got to that last period of the day, it's like it it flew by. It was easy. But my first class started at 7.05 a.m. I still remember that. 7.05 a.m. was my, it was zero period is what they called it. And my high school juniors in zero period were walking in eating espresso beans and drinking coffee. And this was at a, at that time, it was an affluent high school, right? These were white upper middle class kids for the most part who could not function at 7 a.m. And it's not because they were working until 11 o'clock at night. So what, you know, what we're asking these children to do, shoot 11 o'clock at night, I'm asleep is to do, you know, to work hours that we don't want to work. It, 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 and, and it's jobs, well, also, unfortunately, as you know, here in Florida, or maybe maybe not, but we, last year, or last session, Senate Bill 1718 was signed into law, which is the most anti-Hispanic immigration law. Um, yeah. That if you come into the state, and um, for some reason you wind up getting pulled over or whatever, and you have undocumented people in your car, or let's say you're working from Georgia in the farms in Georgia, and you're Mm -hmm. coming into your next assignment here in the state of Florida, um, you could be arrested and charged as a felon, as a human trafficker. And God forbid if there's a child in there, because then now that family, and it could be your son, it could be your nephew, it could be your family, you could be Kim 
and it doesn't matter. You can be charged as a human trafficker, and and those penalties for human trafficking here in the state of Florida is mandatory prison. You know, and if it's a child, Lord have mercy, fifteen years, and this you could actually break up a family, right? So it's it's extremely egregious. So much so that one of the farmers, state representative uh, from South Florida, um, he actually had a town hall meeting, and you can look it up on on YouTube. His name is Rick Roth, and he actually told the the migrants, you know, uh, we did this to scare you, yeah, but but please don't go. We need we need workers, you know. So, um, and that, I say, you know, I I, I honestly think. No, no. And and I I think that things like that won't change until nobody's crops get picked, until nobody's pool gets clean, until their houses aren't being built because of the way that we're treating the people who carry the economy. And historically, you know, we talk about what what they don't want to teach, you know, like the fact that America was built on the bodies of enslaved people because the people that came over voluntarily couldn't do the work. The White House is a great example. Right. Designed and built by black people, by slaves. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I know the politically correct term is to say enslaved persons. I'm sorry, I'm from those people. And nobody was considering us as persons at the time. Thank you for the acknowledgement now. But in a historical sense, they were chattel. And it's, 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 it's not too far distant from what we are doing when we have legislation like that, that criminalizes that behavior, right, of being as a family unit and trying to find work, all you're doing is creating people to go to prison to become slaves. And I'm going to use that term because you're going to use prison workers to do labor for next to nothing so that those who own businesses can take advantage of that near free labor to increase their profits. So, you know, it's a, our, our policies have, have had tremendous impact on our communities, on our marginalized communities. I mean, even so much so that, um, you know, it's, I guess it's too woke, but I'm <laughs> Well, I've got you. Now that you bring that word up, because your governor seems to be really fond of, 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 of anti-woke, as, as does mine here in Texas, anti-woke policies. And, and I always challenge people, tell me what woke is. And they can't. Of course not. I mean, but we, we say like so many things that it, it's been culturally appropriated actually from black folks, mm-hmm. because there was a period of time where we could not stay in hotels and motels when we traveled. So we had the green book, right, to tell us where we could stay, stay. and what our families would tell you, tell them is to stay woke, keep your head on a swivel. That's where it came from, because you didn't know who was following you whether or not you'd be pulled out of your car and lynched just for being in the wrong town after the sun went down. That's what that was. But they have, they have appropriated it and bastardized it and tried to turn it into something that it is not. Exactly. So, so here we are, some of our policies. um, uh, I just tell people stay awake. Yeah. Stay awake, be, be alert of what's happening because you see what happens is, is that, a lot of people don't know what state legislators do no. because what they're doing, you know, they're caught up in their own world. And I get it because mm-hmm. you're working two jobs. You're all I know is I got to keep a roof over my head. I got to keep yeah. food on the table and I got to take care of my, my kids, you know, my family. So um, the politicians, that's where politicians get a bad rap because we're not that engaged. And I, I, I've told my my constituents and my family and friends, if you ever see me change who I am, baby, please ask me. You say, what's wrong with you, Susan? <laughs> you know, keep, 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 keep holding me accountable, yeah. you know, because sometimes we get caught in the, in the title or in the thing. Mm, I'm Susan Valdez. All right. Representative I'm Susan, Susan Valdez. Valdez. And what <laughs> I do is represent. Right. You know, so 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 that's where for me, it's not about a title for me. It's not about none of that stuff for me is about bringing awareness and trying to change parts of these individuals that really do not understand. I work with a lot of millionaires. I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, when you have that really disparate, um, that my kid don't need to work, right? Yeah. So, but then again. When, when my, they have privilege, right? Well, again, those privileged well, people. Privileged people, because you have, you have the capacity uh, to, to, to shelter your children and not put them in harm's way and, or, or, you know, anyhow, it's just, yeah. it's just so complicated, but it really isn't because as long as we, as we think that all of our kids have the capacity of doing great things and given the opportunities with the right supports, what a great place this would really be. Stay on that. <clears throat> There's, I wanted to talk to you about teacher training, teacher professional development in the state of Florida. I want you to tell us where you all are. I know that uh, I almost, oh, almost said Mississippi, not Mississippi, Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland um, have legislation that's just being enacted, new legislation coming in this year, being enacted this year, that is mandating that the teacher colleges in their state teach the science of reading and teach scientific strategies. So they're moving to make sure that universities are preparing teachers and putting a lot of money behind it, as well as making sure that their schools are using scientific approaches to instruction. So I want to know where where is Florida on that? Anything happening with teacher training as a strategy to improve outcomes for our marginalized learners? That's that's a very good question. In the state of Florida, you know, we have a, a huge teacher shortage in the state of Florida. Yeah. Gee, I wonder why. I wonder why, right? I mean, you can't, all of these things that the teachers have to, I mean, you can't even put a flag, a, a pride flag in your room. I was going to say, I can say it. You can't say gay, right? I, I can say <laughs> it all day you, long. You can't teach true black history. But I can say gay all day long. You know, um, you, you just can't. Um, it, yes, you, you can't. So um, having said that, now we're trying to figure out how we can help um, help more teachers receive their certification yeah. and find alternative ways of being to certify teachers so that then we can fill those gaps. So as far as the professional development and the training, um, that's really, in, I have to look a little bit more into that part of statute to, to understand mm -hmm. a little bit more if we're doing anything new. But to the best of my knowledge, we're not doing anything per se to help the universities ramp up their colleges of ed, yeah. if that makes yeah. sense. Because yeah. we are, we're trying to encourage folks that didn't go to the college of ed and are looking for a, a different career, let's say an engineer or something. Mm -hmm help you become a teacher, right? So yeah, then we can- yeah, Those alternative paths of certification, yes. right? To get people so, out of, or even those close to retirement, maybe thinking about doing something else to come correct. over and come over and teach. And do that. Um, so so yeah. I think that, listen, I, I would probably get fired as a teacher. <laughs> I know I would. Oh. Because, because <laughs> first of all, I have to build that relationship with that kiddo. Yeah. I have to be able to let that kiddo know, baby, you, I got you and, I, and yeah. I want the best for you. And if you work with me, I work with you and we're going to have a great time. So I would have to first set up my classroom in a sense where it's going to be a fun place to be, uh, mm -hmm. that they want to come to see Ms. Ms. Lopez Valdez and, and they don't want to leave my classroom. That's the mm -hmm. kind of teacher I would want to be. But to get there, you got to build those relationships and you can't build those relationships while you have to make sure that on day two you're teaching it, it, the 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 uh, quadratic equation and <laughs> <laughs> or if you can't acknowledge the fact that the child has two moms or two dads, dads or if you can't you know? acknowledge the fact that the child does not want to be called or recognized by by the the gender they were assigned at birth mm -hmm. right these so, type of things exactly and Anyhow, so I, I know that I would I would not meet the standards on a timely basis because we'll catch it up. But I need to build that relationship with yeah. you. I have to be able to you have to be able to know that as a kid, you can trust me. Yeah. So much so I, that um, I, I do that up here in Tallahassee. I uh, all the interns, they always congregate here and we have real conversations. You know, yeah. they appreciate those. 
by the way, something that we didn't talk about that I want to share with you. Go for it. Is that I save, I have seven bill slots that I'm able to, to present pieces of legislation. And I save one of those bill slots for our high school students back home. Oh, wow. And I have them, I call it ought to be a law. So mm-hmm. what I know that I'm shaping their world. So kids, tell me what it is that you feel important. And I don't know what it is that they're going to present to me. I go cold turkey to, to a, a meeting and I go back to my school board chairman seat and I sit there and we have this, this uh, uh, conversation with the kids and they'll, they'll present their bills, ideas to me, and then I choose one. This past meeting we had, I, I encouraged the school board members to come because I wanted them to understand that they could potentially do this in their own district as to maybe call it ought to be a policy, be policy. right? And, and have the kids engaged. So we had three different schools present, of which two of those schools I assigned to the school board and said, this is your wheelhouse. Y'all need to figure this one out yeah. for the kids. And then I, I carried one of their bills. And the bill that I'm carrying for them, this is how thoughtful these, that I want to share. I want to end this podcast because we talked about a, a lot of ugly stuff yeah. that are real, that we yeah. have to have those courageous conversations and not be, not be shallow about them, but really talk to them of, about the real issues and have that real talk. And by the same token, I want to end with some hope. Mm-hmm. We have some fabulous children that are in our school yeah. districts. And these kids, their idea was, and the way they presented it, it was so, so cute. It says, eating out is an American pastime. Mm. And we know that if you have an allergy, your pastime may not be able to be the same. Right. Because you can lose your life. Yeah. So their idea was to ensure that managers in the restaurant business and anyone that touches food has a specific training on how to detect allergens in people and how to react to those. And by the same token, every restaurant needs to have a poster reminding them about the allergens. So these are the thoughts of 16 and 15 year olds about how to help some of their friends that have allergies. Um, We had another one that came into law and this one was really, really special. These were kids that had friends who were in the foster system. Mm-hmm. And they, they were kids that were of means, that had a little bit more middle class kids. Yeah. And they thought that it was unfair that these children didn't even know what their rights and responsibilities were as being a child of the state of Florida. So wow. many of the kids didn't know that they had their college paid for. Many of the kids didn't know what really neglect abuse really meant. So their idea was to create a bill of rights for these children. And it that got kind into law. So I have hope that although these conversations have been going on for years, we stand on the shoulders, Dr. Ben mm-hmm. Berry, on so many that have fought these battles before us. We just can't be complacent. We have to be smart. We have to be intentional with how we talk about this and help bring awareness and hopefully change those hearts because there is still hope in our children. Absolutely. It's not so, time to grow. <laughs> no, no. I always sign off with a paraphrase of, I say, the great Dr. Angela Davis. And she said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. So I always ask my guests, what is the one thing you cannot accept? And then what can listeners do to support a change to that effect? So you've got it already. I can see it on your face. Hypocrisy. Say what you mean, mean what you say. And if you learned something and was educated that maybe changed your mind, give credit to the, hey, I spoke to Dr. Barry. And guess what? In our conversation, I figured out that maybe we need to pay a little bit more attention to equity, X, whatever. And just admit it. Don't be a hypocrite because 
those hypocrisies is what gets things so twisted. Mm. And those are the things that we can't change. So one of the things that I believe is sometimes you can't dance around the truth. You can't dance around what's really in your face. You've got to call it is what it is in a kind and a respectful manner. Because at the end of the day, that's how we are going to set the tone as leaders elected by our constituents or leaders within your communities, that that community looks at you as, wow, we have hope in Dr. Barry because she's going to help us get the school lunch fixed, whatever the thing might be, you know, and hypocrisy is something that we can't change because you can't change other people. So it's up to us not to be hypocrites and to say, if we're going to say we're going to do X, then do X and get it done. Don't say that you don't do this, but behind closed doors, hmm, yes, you do. <laughs> you know, um, because, you know, a great example is an organization that was grown right out of here in Florida. Yeah. You the know, Moms for Liberty. Moms for that. Yeah, that's the one that yeah. goes around talking about books and things of that nature, yet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right now. So that's one thing that I just, that hypocrisy has got to stop. It does. All right. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today has been Representative Susan Lopez Valdez. Her full bio and contact information for those of you who live in Florida, or maybe you are an elected official from somewhere else who just wants to find out more about her ought to be a law or ought to be a policy initiative you'll be able to contact her office. I'm going to say Susan, representative of this. Thank you for joining me. It is always a pleasure to speak with you and a pleasure to have a voice who is doing good things in the state of Florida on the show. Equity Warriors out there, Representative Lopez Valdez says, an education can never be erased. So please, let's continue to work to make sure that every child gets the education that they deserve. Get involved. Stay involved. You know it. Vote like your life depended on it and make sure you're voting in those local and state elections. Run for school board. At least attend a school board meeting. Follow me across my channel. Smash that like button. Share, subscribe, and continue to join me again next week. Send me your questions, topics, and requests to info at AskDrBerry.com, and I will answer your questions and bring you experts to help address those topics. As always, don't worry about the things you cannot change. Change the things you can no longer accept. And I'll see you next time.